in the previous lecture we discussed about the bandwidths of mos devices and in general mos amplifier circuits however from an rf engineer's point of view that analysis alone is not enough that analysis alone is not enough because those analysis are done using voltages and currents so as rf engineers we know that the definition of voltage and current at rf frequencies is rather loose why because those depend on both time as well as position so therefore to analyze amplifiers or any other active kind of rf networks or circuits we again have to go back to s parameters we again have to go back to s parameters so so when we define s parameters for active rf devices and circuits or networks how do we how do we essentially characterize this well if you talk about two things one is a mos device or only a mos transistor the second is the whole amplifier circuit so if i have just a single mos transistor versus a whole amplifier circuit let us say which looks like this what we need to do for every case is to look at the small signal model of each of this so therefore as we know by now this is the gate drain source and body this is the cgs this is the cgd this is the dependent current source this rds and this is the drain terminal and this is the source terminal likewise for this if this becomes rd the gate side there won't be much change something of this kind so before we actually analyze the s parameters of any active rf device or circuit the first thing that we must remember is that these models they are very dynamic because these models are valid only for a given bias condition let's say for example this capacitance the capacitance cgs depends not just on the material that is being used it also depends on the bias condition because depending on how strong the gate bias is the channel will become that much thicker or thinner or the charge accumulation may may change likewise more importantly the gm vgs or the drain current may change with the bias and the gm will definitely change even rds will change so the first most important things to remember is that the s parameters depend on the 
circuit elements which in turn depend on the bias condition. So therefore first thing to know is that the S parameters So what, what are the things that define the bias condition? Let us say the gate to source DC voltage. I should say over here the DC bias condition. VGS, the DC drain current ID, the drain to source DC voltage VDS and so on. These are three major uh, criteria that determine the bias. So first thing to remember is that the S parameters of any RF device or circuit depend heavily on the DC bias. So if you look at different data sheets or you look at the products for RF active circuits that are available in the market, you will see that they, their S parameters are always specified for a given bias condition. This is extremely important to remember. Secondly, the other factor is that S parameters depend on the frequency. And that should not come as a surprise because with frequency, the reactance offered by the reactive elements would change. Therefore, the S parameters would definitely change. So, the first thing that we will quickly discuss over here on this related topic is the different kinds of biasing for MOS amplifiers. Very quickly we will discuss, you may already be familiar with this biasing techniques from your basic circuits courses. So let's look at a common source amplifier. The first technique is where we have a VDD, the one which I have been showing you for most part until now. Here we have the AC V in and here we have the AC V out. This is called as a fixed bias. This is called as a fixed bias because of the resistance in the drain side which is fixed. So let's, let us say if you have the circuit then the small signal gain, voltage gain that is AV which is nothing but V out by V in that is defined as minus GM times RD where GM is the transconductance of this MOSFET for a given bias condition. The second type of bias looks kind of like this where the resistor essentially is replaced with a MOSFET which is an NMOS that looks like this. So because of the way the gate and the drain are short circuited together, this upper transistor, let's call it as M2 and we will call this as M1, this M2 is always in saturation. So if you were to have a bipolar transistor in its place and have the collector and the base terminal shorted together, this would behave kind of like a diode. So therefore, although this is not strictly a diode, this is called as a diode connected load bias. And over here, the small signal voltage gain is given as minus GM1 times the effective resistance of this upper transistor, which in the earlier case was RD, but in this case it's not. 
this comes out to be 1 by gm2 therefore the gain is minus gm1 by gm2 so generally this quantity is rather small so you cannot achieve very large gains with this the third kind of biasing is where this m2 is replaced with a pmos and this pmos is biased with a dc voltage let us call it as vb again this is m1 and this is m2 in this case the voltage gain ab is given again as minus gm1 times the net resistance seen by this m1 or in general you, you can even say for this first case it's rd parallel to rds so let's not ignore that then this one is given as gm1 times the rds of the m1 in parallel with the rds of m2 so this comes out to be rds1 in parallel it's rds2 so with this you can get pretty high gain here also you can get moderate gain this is low gain and this is high gain because of this rd if you were to use a nanoscale technology this would consume a lot of area whereas these two since they use only transistors they both use low chip area for both of these so so we shall adopt one procedure where we know what the kind of bias is and it often happens for most practicing rf engineers is that the amplifiers that are needed to be used they are already given to us in the form of a chip that's like saying that transistors and the biasing networks they are all inside the chip what we have access to is only the power supply points and the input and output points so the ball game sort of changes in that sense from an application perspective where the chip is given to us and then we need to ask ourselves what can we do with this chip and can we use it as an amplifier with the most optimal process so as i was just mentioning suppose somebody gives you a chip this con contains mos transistors plus their biasing networks what we have access to is a vdd terminal and a ground terminal and we have an input and an output so once the vdd is fixed once the vdd is fixed effectively what happens is that by fixing the vdd we are essentially fixing the biasing network we are fixing all the dc quantities like id vgs vds etc and thereafter we can apply the small signal model by considering all the dc sources as deactivated so the small signal equivalent the small signal equivalent of this circuit would be the same chip 
this is what the chip would effectively reduce to. Now what we are seeing is that we are only concerned with what is the V in and the V out or the input side and the output side. So effectively this becomes similar to a two port network. This is the input side, this is the output side. We can call this again as port 1 and port 2. So this kind of ICs, this kind of ICs or chips where the amplifier is already packaged for us and given to us. For an RF engineer, for various applications that is useful and this kind of chips are called as MMICs. It stands for monolithic microwave integrated circuits. So here there are two different fields which you can adopt. You can go to that field which deals with what is inside the chip. How are these MOS devices laid out? How are the biasing networks designed? That is called as RFIC design. Radio Frequency Integrated Circuit Design. But once you have the whole chip in your hand, that is what is an MMIC. And many RF engineers also work with MMICs to see what plethora of applications can be achieved using MMICs. So you can either choose to go for on-chip work or off-chip work. If you ever go for a career in RF, both domains have their own applications and techniques. So therefore, coming back to MMIC, if you look at an MMIC amplifier, so effectively this becomes a two-port network. So obviously, since this is a two-port network, I can define an S-matrix, which is going to look like this. Obviously, again, I will repeat those two points which I mentioned. This S-matrix is for a given bias condition and for a given frequency. Because S-parameters depend on both bias conditions as well as the frequency. The two points which I mentioned during the initial part of the same lecture. So it's like saying suppose suppose I have an MMIC amplifier with me. So if I have an MMIC amplifier and I look at its data sheet. And if that data sheet defines the S parameters, it can define it for the four parameters S11, S12, S21, and S22. So as I mentioned, these depend on the frequency. So therefore, most data sheets for MMIC amplifiers that you will come across will have these defined for different frequencies. Let us say it's starting from some frequency, say for example 500 megahertz, you will have one set of values. 600 megahertz, you will have another set of values. Likewise, you can have all the way till the highest frequency this MMI amplifier works, let us say 3 gigahertz. For this frequency, you will have another set of S parameters. Now, like the way in this course earlier on, we had analyzed different kinds of RF networks which were passive. So for every network, we used to ask ourselves three criteria. Matching, losslessness and reciprocity. 
Can we do the same thing over here? Can we do the same thing over here? For MMIC amplifiers. So, Let us say I have this MMIC, which is essentially a two port network. So for an amplifier, I have well defined points, which is the input port, which is the output port. This is port one, this is port two. You can give input here and get the output here, not vice versa. So immediately I can say this is non-reciprocal. This is non-reciprocal. What about losslessness? Definitely it is lossy. Because of all these elements like RDS, etc. There could be RD also inside. Meaning there are resistive elements. So therefore, obviously the amplifier is a lossy element. It's a lossy network. The third question comes is matching. This we cannot answer. We cannot answer without actually looking at the parameters of this MMIC. So it may be matched only if S11 and S22 are both zero. If this is satisfied, it can be matched. But we are not making any such claim that whatever MMIC comes across in our path, they are matched or they are unmatched. We need to see what they are because every MMIC is different. They consist of different transistors. They consist of different bias networks, so on and so forth. So definitely we know that it's not reciprocal. It is lossy and for matching, we really cannot say anything. It could be matched. It could be unmatched also. So in general, in general, what we can say is that if we have an MMIC amplifier, A small segment model of it looks like this, the black box. All, all the small signal elements are inside this black box. So the input side, I have a source that is connected over here and over here we have a load. Let's say this is ZL and if we were to define the S parameters for this MMIC amplifier, we would have to define the characteristic impedance of the feed lines, which is Z0. So let us say at some frequency, at a given frequency, the S parameter matrix is this. The MMIC amplifier at a given frequency would have a fixed set of S parameters. So just the way we had defined for any network, we will say that this is port 1, this is port 2 and we will define the set of entering and exiting voltage. Let's say this is V1 plus, this is V1 minus, the entering wave is always plus, the exiting wave is minus. So let's say there's one more wave which is coming out of port 2 and one wave which is entering port 2. So the entering one will be called V2 plus and this one will be called as V2 minus. So for matched source and load, That is when ZL equal to Z0 and the source impedance also equals Z0, we can define these parameters. That is V1 minus and V2 minus will be equal to this matrix times V1 plus and V2 plus. 
So therefore, if we were to open this matrix equation, what we would get is something like this. V1 minus is equal to S11, V1 plus, plus S12, V2 plus, and V2 minus is S21, V1 plus, plus S22, V2 plus. Once again, this is only in the mesh condition. This is only in the mass condition. Now, this is where the difference between active circuits and passive circuit comes. For passive circuits, we have conveniently assumed that the load at any port is always matched to the characteristic impedance. And for most cases, that is true also. But for amplifiers, it is never like that. For amplifiers, somebody may tell you that I'm giving you this MMIC amplifier and I need this MMIC to give the output across some load that is already specified, some ZL impedance which is already specified, which need not be equal to the characteristic impedance. Well, of course, we could use impedance matching, no problem. But before doing that, the question is, supposing for a minute that there is no impedance matching, the network is connected to some unmatched load, can some other analysis be done? Can some other analysis be done? Well, suppose this is my MMIC amplifier. Let's say this is my input and this is my output port. We'll call this as ZL, the impedance at the load. The feed line characteristic impedances is always Z0. This is port 2. We'll call this as V2 minus. This is V2 plus. This is V1 plus and this is V1 minus. So, this is my amplifier. AMP superscript R indicates amplifier. What happens over here? is in general, we can define something called as the input impedance. That is the impedance that is seen by looking into the amplifier inputs. This is the input impedance. Likewise, using this quantity, we can define something called as gamma in or the reflection coefficient looking into the input of the amplifier. And that definition is very simple, Zn minus Z0 divided by Zn plus Z0. So, this is what gamma in is. Likewise, we can define the load reflection coefficient also gamma L, where gamma L, as you know, is Zn minus Z0 divided by Zl plus Z0. You can also define the output impedance and the output reflection coefficient, but we'll check that out later. So the question is, if the amplifier is connected to some load ZL and it has some S parameters S11, S12, S21, S22 at a certain frequency F, if this is the case, can I calculate what will be the input impedance or the gamma in? Can I do that? Well, I can. Although the analysis is not all that straightforward. So let us see how we can do this by treating the MMIC amplifier 
as a black box. To do this analysis, to do this analysis, we will go back to a concept from control systems, which is called a signal flow graphs. Signal flow graph is a way to represent any system wherein we have the voltage where the rule is voltages are defined as nodes and all coefficients like the S parameters, reflection coefficients, gain etc. they are represented as branches. Their branches. So therefore, if we were to represent this as a signal flow graph, how can we do this? We can immediately see that there are four voltages. So we can have four nodes, V1 plus over here, V1 minus over here, V2 minus over here and V2 plus over here. We can do this. And from these equations, we know what is the relationship between V1 minus V2 minus with the plus voltages. So if we assume that the network is matched, if you assume initially that ZL equal to Z0, then we can say that this V1 minus is S11 times V1 plus plus S12 times V2 plus. So if I were to multiply the V1 plus by S11, that is represent this one, this branch by coefficient called as S11 and from V2 plus I multiply by a coefficient called S12. The product of these two will get added over here. So node is also a summation. Likewise, V2 minus is S21 times V1 plus. Plus S22 times V2 plus. Yes, this is under mass condition. Now let us modify this considering that port 2 is not matched. Considering port 2 is not matched. So therefore, let us redraw this. So rather than showing the V1 uh, plus and V1 minus over here, I am showing them here. And I am just simply having a branch of gain 1 in each case, so that doesn't really change anything. So if we redraw, this is S21, this is S11, this is S12 and this is S Two, two. This is V2 minus and this is V2 plus. Right? Now, let us take into account this load impedance. So, this load impedance essentially connects V2 plus with V2 minus. So, here I can say this gamma L also is nothing but V2 plus divided by V2 minus. So at the same time I can say V2 plus is gamma L times V2 minus. 
So I can have one more branch. And the coefficient of that branch will be gamma L. Why? Because V2 plus is gamma L times V2 minus. This is the way we can define the whole amplifier with the unmatched load in the signal flow graph condition or representation for a given bias condition for a given frequency. Do not ever forget that. Now, now, what we can do, what is our aim? We need to find out what is gamma in. And the gamma in is nothing but V1 minus divided by V1 plus. Remember, gamma in is defined this way, looking into the amplifier. So therefore, it's, it is the outcoming wave divided by the entering wave. This is what we want to find out. So looking from the signal flow graph, looking from the signal flow graph, we can indeed find out what is V1 minus by V1 plus. And that we can find out using something called as Mason's rule. which shows that the path gain from one path to another path is nothing but the contribution for from all individual paths. Let us say if there are n number of paths of k going from 1 to n, the path gain of the kth path pk times delta k divided by delta. So all of these have some significance. You may already be aware of this from your control systems course. So I shall not discuss about it too much. I shall only mention, I shall, I shall only mention that pk is the path gain of the kth path, delta has a pretty complex formula which depends on each loop and branch which are touching or non-touching, delta k is the value of delta using the loops not touching the kth path. So let us do this with an example. Let us do this with an example. So if we want to go from V1 plus to V1 minus, how many paths are there? There are two paths. Path 1 is the shorter path over here. So therefore, we will say P1 is S11. P1 is S11. Now path 2 is the longer path with arrows in the same direction. All this way from S21, gamma L times S12, it comes over here. So we will call this as path 2 and the path gain is nothing but the product of all the coefficients in the path. So this becomes out to be S21 times gamma L times S12. Is that fine? Now how many loops are there in this system? There is only one loop and this is this. So loop 1 Loop 1 is where the branches kind of look like a circular fashion. So loop 1 is the product of the branches, the branch coefficients in each path. That is S22 times gamma L. So therefore, I can say this quantity delta is nothing but 1 minus the first loop that is S22 times gamma L. And also there are other terms for loops, pair of loops which are not touching to each other. But in this case, that does not happen. So therefore, delta is equal to this quantity. So for each path, there will be something called as delta k. So there will be delta 1 and delta 2. So delta 1 for path 1, so let's put it over here. Delta 1 is 1 minus the loop which is not touching path 1. So this loop is not touching path 1. So we will get 1 minus S22 gamma L which turns, comes out to be the same as delta. For delta 2, 
it has to be 1 minus the loop gain for the loops which is not touching the second path. There is no such loop because this loop is touching the second path. So it's 1 minus 0 which is 1. So therefore there are just two paths. So delta is this quantity. So let, let us so, so the, therefore the gamma in now will be P1 delta 1 plus P2 delta 2 divided by delta. So this is P1, this is P2. So S11 times this quantity 1 minus S22 comma L plus S21 gamma L S12 times 1 which is the same quantity divided by delta that is 1 minus S22 comma L. So I can actually cancel out these two terms and what I will see effectively is that gamma in which is V1 minus divided by V1 plus is actually equal to S11 plus S21 gamma L S12 divided by 1 minus S22 comma L. Now notice something very interesting. Notice something very interesting. Had the load been matched to port 2, gamma L would have been 0. So therefore the second term would have totally vanished and gamma in would have become equal to S11 and that is what we expect that for a match network S11 will indeed indicate the reflection coefficient at port 1. So this is important. Second, if you have an amplifier whose input is at port 1 and the output is at port 2. So generally input comes at port 1, output goes, goes at port 2. If you give some input at port 2, you don't expect anything at port 1. So for most amplifiers or for most MMIC amplifiers, we expect that S12 must be very very small. This is another important concept. This is another important concept. Likewise, I can get an expression for the voltage gain also. Voltage gain is the output at port 2 divided by the input at port 1. So the output at port 2 is V2 minus and the input at port 1 is V1 plus. So if I want to go from V1 plus to V2 minus, there is just one path that is S21 and there is just one loop. So therefore, again, if you are using Mason's gain formula, you will find that this comes out to be S21 divided by 1 minus S22 times gamma L. Again, if you notice, for if the load was matched, the voltage gain would have been S21. And that is what we expect out of a match network. So, we call S21 as the intrinsic gain or intrinsic voltage gain of the MMIC amplifier. That is the gain that it is able to provide in the mass condition. So we would expect ideally that we should be able to get S21. And it seems as though we are doing something to the denominator by having this gamma L which is not, which is not making the gain of this whole MMIC equal to S21. 
I will end the lecture with one small statement. We expect that under match condition, the gain of this amplifier should be S21. But remember both S22 and gamma L are indicative of reflection coefficients. So therefore we know that S22 and gamma L both of their magnitudes are below 1. So therefore what happens? Therefore the product of these two, the magnitude of the product of S22 and gamma L will again be less than 1. So therefore if you are dividing S21 by this quantity 1 minus something that is less than 1, this quantity will actually come out to be more than S21. So therefore this turns out to be something very very interesting. So the voltage gain AV will be actually more than S21. What we are claiming is that we always want a match load in the ideal case. But here we are seeing that even if the load is not matched, the voltage gain that we are getting is actually more than the gain that the amplifier can provide in the matched condition. And this is able to open up a whole new world of opportunities for an RF designer that we are able to get more voltage gain by not matching the load. So therefore, we shall continue from this point onwards in the next lecture where we shall build upon this concept. Thank you.